we're gonna talk about anxiety and depression, and this is where those protocols that you have start to become relevant. And one of the things you'll notice, if I can just borrow yours for a moment, so I'm gonna pull out the anxiety protocol. We're gonna be talking about these various aspects of this protocol today. I'm not gonna march through the whole thing because you have it, but I do wanna highlight that to include one of the natural ingredients that's listed here, unbranded, of course, we had to have two randomized trials that were concordant that showed a benefit in terms of that natural ingredient. And so one of the things you'll find is that there are 90 randomized trials listed in the back. Now the font is kind of small. You get to my age and you can't even read it without glasses. Um, but all of that literature is there for you. We're gonna talk about the chemical imbalance theory of anxiety and depression, how the, how the reasons why I think it's insufficient and um, really fails our patients. We're gonna talk about the epidemiology of anxiety and depression, especially the way that it differentially affects women. Women have a particular vulnerability, I would say with the, the next three items that we're gonna be talking about, anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline. So we know that with depression and with um, Alzheimer's disease, women are diagnosed at double the rate of men. And we still don't totally understand why that is. We have a massive gender research gap when it comes to women's health. And I, I wanna be working to solve that. We'll do our root cause analysis. We'll also talk about some personalized lifestyle medicine strategies. We'll see how far we get before we get to our Q&A, which is always my favorite time of um, the morning that we have together. And I also just wanna say a number of cases are in the book. So if we don't get to the cases, I want you to know that the cases are described pretty thoroughly here. I went through about 2,500 citations that I read for this book. And for some reason, my publisher didn't want to add 100 pages of scientific citations to the end. I'm not sure why. Um, he said no one would read it. And so we had to take the citations and put them on my website. So you can find those at brainbodydiet.com forward slash notes. So I believe this chemical imbalance theory, the one that I grew up with when I went through my medical training and my residency training, is oversimplified, false, and incomplete. And it's amazing to me that antidepressants vie with statins as the number one prescription in the US. We know that one in four women over the age of 40 is prescribed an antidepressant. And that is appalling to me because I think there are so many root causes for why women and men feel depressed and often they don't get evaluated. So to me, that's part of why we're here today is to understand root cause analysis and to go a little deeper to understand the role of the gut brain axis as well as other factors like hormones um, and to go a little deeper than what I think the chemical imbalance theory, this idea that you don't have enough serotonin, so we need to crank up your serotonin, or oh, maybe you don't have enough norepinephrine, so why don't we crank that up too? Um, I don't think that approach has been successful. If you just look at a simple measure of what's the rate of remission for patients who have major depression and they're prescribed in a prescription antidepressant, it's 30%. 30%, I think that's appalling. I think we can do so much better. So anxiety, I'm just gonna give a quick definition here. It's an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes, such as increased blood pressure, increased heart rate. When I talk about anxiety today, I'm not talking about generalized anxiety disorder or some of the um, conditions that are more disabling. I'm talking more about the garden variety anxiety that I see all day long in my medical practice. I also really consider anxiety to be the emotional experience of a flight, flight, freeze response. And I think the issue is sometimes the control system for flight, flight, freeze 
becomes impaired. Maybe you've noticed this in your practice. I, I think as an engineer, when I approach these things, I think of, okay, if we go back to the sympathetic nervous system and how it's in balance with the parasympathetic nervous system, we talked about how you can measure that with HRV, that's one homeostatic system. There's lots of homeostatic systems. There's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. There's, um, what other homeostatic systems do we have? We have the immune system. There's lots of different homeostatic systems. And the, the name of the game, at least as far as I can tell, after 25 years of practice, is that we want to help our patients return to homeostasis. We want to help them define homeostasis and return to it. And I, I'm kind of an optimistic person. I thought that you could always return to homeostasis. I thought the human body was kind of amazing that way. But increasingly, I have found that there's a point that you can cross where it's no longer reversible to get back into homeostasis. And so we might touch upon that as we go through our conversation about anxiety and depression today. So every year, the American Psychological Association does a survey, a massive stress survey of um, Americans. And what they found in 2018 is that 40% of Americans report being more anxious than they were the previous year. 40% more anxious. That's pretty high. Are you seeing this in your practice? More anxiety? I'm seeing more of it. I especially see it in my younger women. I especially see it postpartum. I especially see it in my perimenopausal patients. I see it across the entire lifespan, but those are when the hot spots are. And there's molecular reasons for that that we'll get into. So I confess to you at the beginning that I'm not a gastroenterologist. I'm not a microbiome expert. I'm not a neurologist. I'm a gynecologist, and my focus is hormones. I do a lot of bioidentical hormone balancing. I'm happy to answer questions about that. But I think it's essential to realize that there's hormonal causes of anxiety. And this is the part that makes me a little crazy in terms of the patients who go in to see their primary care doctor, maybe, and report their symptoms of anxiety. They get asked a few more questions, and then they get prescribed what? benzodiazepines, maybe an antidepressant, maybe some Xanax. Um, I don't think I'm supposed to say brand names on the live stream. Apologies. <laughs> I think I said Keflex earlier, too. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think it's really important that we not just have this pill for every ill approach, but instead be thinking of root cause analysis. And so if we look just at hormonal root causes, there's a number of them. There's dysregulated cortisol. There's insulin resistance. And you may have noticed, I feel it. I just checked my blood sugar. I'm back to the 90s, which is where I like to hang out. I'm not at 130 anymore. I was a little amped up for that first talk. Did you notice? My sugar was a little high. So I'm happy that um, my, my insulin resistance is getting better. Thyroid dysfunction. So usually hyperthyroidism is associated with anxiety, but I often see patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis who have a flare, and that can trigger anxiety. I also see um, patients who are low, especially in T3, free T3, who have uh, palpitations or other symptoms like that. I'm sure you've seen that as well. Low estrogen. So I think of estrogen as the master regulator of the female body. We're going to get into the details with estrogen. Because I think when it starts to falter, women who are vulnerable really notice. And there's a couple of places where estrogen changes. The first is puberty. And that's where estrogen starts to increase, along with oxytocin. That's why teenagers, like my daughter who's 14, all she cares about right now are her friends and how she looks in the mirror. That is estrogen and oxytocin talking. So she's at a camp at Stanford right now, a volleyball camp, and I keep getting these texts from her. Mom, I have no friends. <laughs> Mom, come pick me up. I'm like, I'm in Dallas. I can't come pick you up. <laughs> but that's what happens as estrogen starts to climb and oxytocin starts to climb. Like, you care about your appearance. And then there's postpartum, where your hormones go from sky high 
estriol and progesterone to almost nothing when you deliver that beautiful baby and a placenta. And that can be a preview of coming attractions in terms of perimenopause because you have very little in the way of estradiol. So when I was breastfeeding my first baby, I remember lying in bed, it was like day three, my milk had come in, and I'm, I'm so excited about this beautiful baby who's now 19, and I'm looking at her, loving this moment, and I have tears streaming down my face. And I, I'm just like, what is going on? And then I realize I'm like sweating profusely. Here I am, a gynecologist, with no estradiol in my body, and I'm not like putting two and two together and realizing that I'm having a perimenopausal state. I'm having hot flashes and night sweats and emotional lability related to estrogen metabolism in my body. So then perimenopause happens, and you get this, but it's more sustained. In fact, estradiol can uh, markedly change day to day, even hour to hour and minute to minute. There can be wild fluctuations of estradiol. And that often can trigger anxiety in people who are vulnerable towards that. There's some genomic risks that puts you at increased vulnerability. I think they're in the slide somewhere. Um, and then there's the other phenotype, which is the patients that are more prone to depression, perhaps related to the gene environment interaction. Low progesterone can do it as well, which I think is another reason for the changes that occur in perimenopause and also postpartum. And then I think it's important to realize that the sex hormones and neurotransmitters interact together as part of what I consider to be the gut-brain axis. In fact, I think with my patients, I used to think in terms of the neurohormonal dashboard of the patient that was sitting across from me. Now I've expanded that, and I think in terms of the gut-brain axis and this neurohormonal dashboard. So we know women are more vulnerable what I've listed here is lifetime risk. So lifetime risk is 33% for anxiety. That's pretty high. It's much lower for men. Not quite half, but much lower. But I would say with men, it can be harder to diagnose. So I just launched a documentary on um, anxiety. It's about... 35, 40 minutes, if you want to watch it. It's an interview. It's a documentary with interviews of my patients as well as patients of two other clinicians that are in the documentary. One is Miles Spar, who takes care of men. He's based in Los Angeles. And the other is Philomena Trindade, who's on the faculty at um, Institute for Functional Medicine as well as A4M. And uh, she's a family practice doctor in uh, a little south of San Francisco. So if you want to watch this documentary, it is at brainbodydiet.com. So if you go there, the documentary will pop up. It's free. Um, we don't come out and say this, but the patient who is mine is the textile artist. And you'll notice right away, because uh, it shows her doing her artwork. So anxiety in men. What Miles talks about when he is in the documentary and in our conversations, he talks about how men don't come in and say, I'm feeling anxious. They tend to come in more with physical symptoms. They come in with back pain or headaches. And so it can be a little trickier to discern whether anxiety is the underlying symptom and where to dig deeper. We know that lifetime risk of depression is 21%. Lifetime risk of Alzheimer's disease is 15 to 17%. That's pretty high. We'll talk about the epidemic of Alzheimer's in the next talk. 